Everybody, welcome to the YouTube channel. Today we have Eric, the founder of Growth Engine X, here to talk about his journey and how he uses cold email. Eric, welcome to the channel. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, to kick us off today, the first question I always ask is, who are you and what do you do? My name is Eric Noloslavsky, and I run a cold email agency. I like to say our tagline is, we help you send that same message that you would manually write uh, if you took 10 minutes to research your prospect, but we send it to your entire market. I like that. That's cool. And uh, how long have you been, first off, in online business and second off in cold email? So cold email, five years, uh, online business, three. Okay, so you started working in cold email like a company before I started as a business, or how did that happen? Oh, so I would say I was doing it within a company as like my function was I was the first person in the company to kind of crack. Okay. If we do this with inboxes and we build this list and we do this, then I could send more emails than the rest of the sales team. And so now the sales team, they could just focus on cold calling and I'll just handle everyone's emails. So that's like more of where I got started. You know, it's really interesting you mentioned that. And I'm going to emphasize this because I do have a lot of younger listeners like in their teens or early twenties where they kind of think the idea of getting a job initially is a bad idea, but it's funny how a lot of the most successful entrepreneurs I talk to in terms of a fast time frame actually started in a job capacity and moved to an agency. And um, I can speak for myself as someone who didn't really have that job capacity first. You know, there's a lot of things you have to figure out and um, you know, your time frame of going to where you started, where you are now in three years, that's really fast. So I'd imagine that probably the job capacity was like a way to get paid while learning. Would that be fair to say? I 100% agree with what you're talking about. I actually find when people want to graduate college and the first thing that they want to do is start a business, I actually think that that's probably not a great idea because I think in some ways it's like trading um, trading short-term cash and you're discounting yourself for the future because the things that you miss out on is you miss out on how does normal business communication get done? Um, like one of the most mind blowing things to me when I finished business school and then got a regular job was I had no clue how to send an email of like, like, how do you send a professional email requesting something, not even a sales thing, requesting information from somebody or, or whatever it might be. That was mind blowing to me that business school hadn't taught us that you learn how teams work and how managerial structures work. You see how the office, you know, communicates with each other, um, but most most importantly, especially if you're going to run an agency like ours, is you understand what it's like to purchase something. Because if you never are on that side of the table, you have no clue what that feels like. And probably the biggest lesson that I learned is that um, we would put together deals where the ROI was so clear. And it was like we were putting together solar deals. So it was contractual that whatever we said was going to happen, they could sue us into oblivion if the solar deal uh, didn't you know, meet their needs, right? And also we, it was going to work. It's solar. Like it was all math and everything. And um, these companies, they, they wouldn't move forward. And I was like, what the heck? Like you will save money. We're talking about saving like salary, multiple salaries worth of people per year. Why aren't you going to do this? And they basically would say, you know, if this works, I'm going to get a pat on the back. But if this doesn't work, I'm going to get fired. And that was one of the biggest uh, eye-opening things for me about when you're talking with somebody th went through like purchasing that like, if it works, it, it's going to be like, okay, it's like not going to be so game changing that they're going to get a promotion from it most likely. And if it doesn't work, they're, they're on the chopping block. So then you can really have a different understanding for, for sales when you've been working in a business before. I really like that you emphasize that. And I learned this myself going from working at smaller agencies to now our average client does eight figures a year where really the selling point when you're selling to somebody who doesn't, I can say doesn't care too much, but their goal is to feed their family, to pay their mortgage, to have their vacation. Now, there are some exceptions where like they're really hungry and they want to grow a company and they're motivated maybe to have a revenue share structure. But especially in large organizations, it's I don't want to get fired. So one of the things that we emphasize of working with us is like, it's funny because you wouldn't think this would be a selling point, but like our do not contact list, how we double check. That's a huge selling point and how we diversify domains, like all the safety features become selling points when you're selling to someone who isn't the owner, which is interesting because if you're mentioning that to like a small agency where you're working with founders, like, yeah, I don't care. So it's 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 a good bit you emphasize that. Now, I'm curious, what was that transition from doing cold email 
for your solar company to actually doing it yourself? Did you start on the side? Did you fully exit? Sure. And I can speak to that a little bit. So I, it wasn't a solar company. I was working actually for a nonprofit that like a way we made money was we helped people like it was a chamber of commerce. So okay. like people would join to like get deals brokered and, and those kind of things. So I started doing cold email there and then I started working for a tech incubator. And so that was a big transition to go from, okay, I know what I'm selling. I completely own this. It, you know, I'm tied to this. I get it to now working for a tech incubator where it's like, okay, what are you guys selling? I know nothing about this industry. You want to email farmers? What are you talking about? Like going through all of those iterations of learning about that. Um, so then that's where I learned the the skill of not being able to just do it for myself, but being able to do it for other people and managing it for other people. And then I would just post on LinkedIn about what I was doing. And then people would just come to me and they would say, hey, you know, the same thing you're doing for the incubator, could you do it for me? And for a while I said no, because, you know, we have to, you know, uh, like I was like, I have to stay focused. And then enough people started asking me that I was like, all right, let me try and like go out on my own and do this. And uh, that was like the, the big transition that I made. That's exciting. So the first clients you got were the ones that were asking you from a tech incubator. So you immediately had clients from day one. Is that correct? So I was working at the tech incubator. They weren't clients from the tech incubator. So I was working at the tech incubator and then I left because people were knocking on my door. But so yes, they were external. And yes, I had clients the the day that I left. Yeah. That's awesome. And and since then, you know, in terms of the ways you get clients, this is a question I love to ask people. Now we both do cold emails as a service. So I'm going to make a big assumption and say cold email is probably one of the ways you get clients. But I know you also do a lot of personal branding as well. When did that become a decision? And also, I just like you to share a bit about the benefit of having a personal brand. Because I think a lot of people don't recognize how massive that can be. It's like adding fuel to the fire on every other bit of outreach you do. Yep. Okay. So the big thing for me is, so I've actually been posting video content um, four or five years. So when I was working at that chamber of commerce, Gary Vaynerchuk was actually one of the past board members on the, the chamber of commerce. And I was a fan of Gary and you know, all those things, sure. but then I was like, you know what? I really want to learn more and like do more of what Gary's saying. So I started posting video content and we could find me, you know, uh, and, and me making a huge mistake. And I'll talk about that um, pretty soon. So I, I've been a big proponent of everybody should be building their personal brand um, a ton. People always ask me about strategy and um, I, I have no strategy. I just try to post anything that I find valuable that I think my audience would find valuable and I try not to hold back. And so the, the big mistake that I was making though is I was posting business and sales advice as a 22 year old and 23 year old that it just kind of didn't, it, it, it was just like odd. Like I would say the same thing that these business gurus would say. So you follow like, you know, Tony Robbins or Gary Vaynerchuk or Grant Cardone or Alex Hermosi. And I was basically saying the same things that they were saying. So I was right, but it's like, who cares? Cause you know, what's going on? The biggest change in personal brand for me happened when I switched from trying to make content to instead just documenting and saying, Hey, okay. So today what we did is I learned how to use GMAS and they've got this warm up service. And so we're going to start doing this. And this is the outcome that we're going to get blah, 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 blah. And then tomorrow, Hey, so I just scraped Instagram for 5,000 email addresses. This is exactly how I did it. Go for it. Right. And so that was probably the biggest change in my personal brand development was going from things that you probably like you think you should be talking about because you see all these big people talking about. But, you, you know, Alex Ramosi has a very funny way of putting this. He's like, you know, you, I could say that you should just invest in the S&P 500 and just take the, the returns from an, an index fund. Warren Buffett could say the same thing, too. And everyone is going to listen to uh, Warren Buffett more than me because I forgot to build Berkshire Hathaway. And I think that's just such a perfect way to, to put it. So when you're doing personal brand, document, don't just like try to create things um, out of nothing. And then as far as the unexpected benefits, like I did this in order to get my name out there and get customers, probably the most unexpected benefit that I didn't know would come of it is one, meeting people like you, like th this is just great to like, we're not having like a business conversation, but I like that we're in each other's world now. You're helping us with stuff in the agency um, too. Felipe has helped us with stuff like that has been amazingly helpful to just network with, with other people. But then the other thing um, is recruitment. Uh, if I needed to hire three more people tomorrow who were experts in clay, we could probably 
do that because, um, you know, I, I just get so many people reaching out every day who like, I follow all your YouTube videos. I've covered everything. If you ever need clay help, we can get it done. I'm like, great. Okay. And then I know other people who are like, I can't even hire an in inbox manager. I'm like, you can't hire an inbox. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's like the easiest thing to hire for. So, um, that's like the most unexpected thing, the recruitment side for sure. My answer would have to be the same on recruitment. I was not expecting that. And it's funny because I didn't even realize it was a thing until I was having a hard time getting applicants and like Upwork and onlinejobs.ph. And then I put it on Twitter. We needed a lead list builder. You know, this is pretty little entry level role. We got like 150 applicants. That is like my best performing tweet ever. Like my top three performing tweets got reposted so much and shared so much. And it was ridiculous because we got like a really good list builder we hired. And he actually moved up in our company and to the point where like we, me and Felipe flew him to spend a month with us training him in person. Like that, that quality of person would probably have not, again, it depends, but that would have been a hard person to source from other areas. And that's true. And it's a big thing is because the kind of person that like the person that I like to hire are the people who they are constantly trying to learn more and do more things. And so if you're putting out learning content and people are following learning content instead of watching Mr. Beast videos, which I mean, I still watch Mr. Beast videos, but mostly because I like to see how they're trying to get people's attention. Um, then yeah, you already know that this person is doing, is like trying to learn more and just makes them such a better candidate than just somebody who's just like blind applying to, to roles. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point because they were proactively looking at content to better themselves. So another thing I recommend that I've done, and this has worked well, is pay attention to those VAs who send you a direct message on Instagram. Even if, if even, even if a copy isn't perfect, they're not a copywriter, they're a VA, but they were at least proactive enough to think to reach out to you. So like a lot of our best hires have been like answering, you know, with Filipinos or Indians that are in your DMs trying to be a VA. Like vote, they're showing enough ambition, right? So that's been another sure. one good for us. Um, now kind of transitioning here a little bit, at least the way I know you and the people that I have spoken to you about all seem to know you as the clay guy, the personalized yeah. email guy. So tell us a little bit for people listening who maybe don't know you, what is special about how you use clay and how you do cold email? Yeah. And so one, I like, I hope it's special and <laughs> that that's one thing. Um, so two, like I said in the beginning, we always try to work backwards from what's the best message that you would send if you were to manually research somebody and then how can you send that to your entire market? So that's what we focus on when we're using Clay and all of the content that I produce about Clay is how can you put together a campaign that, you know, because everybody talks about they're like, oh, you know, like I'd rather have my SDRs manually send emails. I'm like, I bet the same message that they're manually sending, we could totally automate. It's really not that that crazy. And so a lot of people know us from that. And the usage of Clay is like, so I just re released a YouTube video yesterday where we're running four campaigns, um, all with GPT-4, um, you know, text and, and all those things. And so one of them is like sending emails where we come up with ideas that the company is probably doing for their outbound marketing. And then we're saying, Hey, you're probably doing these things manually. Would you want to talk about how we could automate these things? And like their custom ideas made for every single company um, by GPT-4. And then the next test that we're running is like using AI to basically say, Hey, if we were using our solution in your company, this is what it would look like. And then we're analyzing who they sell to what they sell and how we would market it. And then going through like our steps and like showing them and, and things like that. Where then it, now it's like, we can send better emails than we would ever even send manually anyway. And so, um, that's, that's really the focus that we have within the agency is this, like, how do we get that same high quality of a manual email, but working backwards and automating it. And how did you get started with Clay? Because I, I I, always, when I think of you, I think of Clay. I don't know if that's everybody else or just myself, but it seems like that's very embedded in your workflow in your company. So how did that it, start? It for sure is, 100%. And so um, it's so funny. I, I, I find that there's data points that bring relevance to an email campaign and there's data points that bring personalization. And so the relevance is like, hey, like your web traffic is declining. So I just wanted to reach out and see if you thought about like increasing SEO or something like that, right? That, that we would scrape similar web for that. And we'd use Appify and we'd do, oh man, it was, it was a mess. Because if you wanted to do that, you'd have to pull lists from Apollo. You'd have to dedupe all of the companies so that then you could, um, 
you would dedupe all of the companies. So you reduce your cost on Appify to scrape similar web. And then you go into similar web and then you, well, no, you scrape it with Appify. Then you sort it for everybody who's losing web traffic. And then by the time that's done, now you upload it to Dbounce so you can validate all the emails. And then once you're done, you have like 300 leads left. And it's like, oh my gosh, which is fine. But like now you have to rerun that process all over again. True. So one clay just makes it so that we could do all of that in one workflow. Like some people complain about in clay, how long it takes for things to run. And I'm like, I don't care. It, it, it literally does. Because we set up our clay tables in a way that as soon as everything is done running, it syncs with the smart lead campaign like a hundred percent perfectly. So it does not matter to me the way that it, it all shakes out. And so, or like how long it takes to get there because it's going to get there eventually. Um, So the... But I would have clients that we couldn't use that relevance. And I'm sure you see this too, where there's not really a relevant thing to reach out to. So we would just default to my favorite first line and my favorite PS line at the time was, you know, uh, we would reach out to them and we'd look at their past company. And I don't know where you were working before done for you meetings, but like, we'd be like, Michael, I know you didn't leave Salesforce stoked so that you can organize CRMs at done for you meetings, right? And so that would be my favorite first, first line to use. And then my favorite PS line would be like, hey, if we ever chat, I'd love to buy you uh, a gift card for the, uh, and then we'd name the top steakhouse in the area of their their LinkedIn profile. So in order to get that information, I was using Phantom Buster to scrape it, but I got my LinkedIn account banned like three times and we were like messing around with fake LinkedIn accounts and all this other stuff. And then Clay, they were allowing you to just automatically enrich as many LinkedIn profiles as you wanted. And it would give you their past company and it would give you their location. And I was like, perfect. This is exactly what I need. Because the first time I actually used Clay, I thought the whole software was terrible. I, I was like, this, this makes no sense. I'm not going to use it at all. Then somebody showed me the LinkedIn enrichment and I was like, boom, we're going to do this. And then I joined, the, I was working full time at Clay. Um, and I joined the team because we were using Clay in ways that they were like, we haven't been able to teach any of our users to do this. And you're doing it on your own. Could you teach other people how to do it? And so then I joined the team, ran the agency at the same time, but then the agency got so big, I had to pick one or the other and I picked the agency. That's interesting. So you you were actually part of a clay team too. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. For a year, I was on the clay team, like full-time W2 employee. That's awesome. I mean, that probably gave you insights to how to use clay for, I guess, dozens and dozens of industries too. Because I mean, it, one, one thing that's interesting is when you think of like B2B cold email, I think some people think marketing agencies and software, but like yeah. this stuff is relevant for waste management B2B. This is relevant for manufacturing. This is relevant for um, for medical B2B. Like it, oh, anything. It's so broad. And it's funny because the competition inside our little Twitter world is so intense. But when you expand to like all these super traditional boring categories, something like Clay is revolutionary or just cold email is revolutionary. Like, oh, what absolutely. I yeah. Yeah. It's insane. So I, I'm curious, like if your clients, are most of them kind of a typical money Twitter crowd, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, or do you also work with like these random old school uh, B2B companies that are almost like an example, we have a client that manufactures plastic, like. Yeah, yeah. So most of our customers are SaaS companies. And that's, I, I think mainly because of the LinkedIn content, that's kind of who sure. we get connected with and you know, those kinds of things. So most of our customers are SaaS companies. But we do have kind of these like odd, like, oh, that's interesting. So like uh, we work with one company. He comes back every uh, March. So around now, actually, we already set up his domains. I know he's coming back. So he comes back every March, April, and May, and every September, October, and November. And he cleans gutters for apartment buildings. And we just email the property managers. And we're like, hey, that's like, awesome. you know. And the other thing, too, is like. Now I would never send that PS line with the restaurant thing to a SaaS founder because they see right through it. And as soon as you send that, they, um, uh, as soon as they see that, they're like, okay, this was a, like a spam email. I'm out. Like it, it actually hurts your email if you send something like that. But to these property managers, they've never seen that before. So you send that and they're like, wow, this is like one of the greatest emails I've ever received before. Yeah, I've been to that restaurant. And so, uh, yeah, I, I love working with the, you know, the like the companies that are kind of those odds and ends, but we just have a lot of SaaS because that's who comes to us. Sure. So yeah, that makes sense. Well, I am. Um, I want to get. I have one last question for you. So we've talked a bit about how you started. We've talked about your involvement of Clay, who you're working with. A lot of good topics covered. I always like to know, you know, what is your personal goal to company? Is the goal to make this into a massive company, the big team, and exit? Do you want to make it passive? Is this a transition to starting your own software companies? Like, what are the next? you know, I guess shorter term, next couple of years, I and mean, what do the next 10 years look like for you? 
Yeah. And so I see the business as something that first and foremost, I want to grow the enterprise value to a point where, to be completely honest, if I get hit by a bus, it would still produce revenue and sure. I would be insulated from like very bad things happening in my life that I would still be able to produce income from. Cause, um, and we've got like three minutes. So I'll try to, to, to go through it quickly. Um, whether you're building a hundred million dollar software company or you're building a restaurant, both of them take a lot of work. Uh, but one could possibly, you know, change your life and you could become a billionaire. And then the other one is like, you know, you know, you're going to own a pizza shop. And so I guess the way I think about it is like, if I'm going to work on something all the time, I at least want to build something that is either going to create wealth that like I would be fine to retire, um, you know, on time and with enough money that I don't have to worry about anything. Or if I can get it to an enterprise level where um, an enterprise level where if I were to fall sick and I'm not able to work, sure. I could still, you know, get revenue and, and things for myself and personal income. Um, and that, but really another goal that I have, that's a little bit bigger than that. That's kind of my like safety goal. Like when I'm worrying about things, I always want that to happen. What I'm really trying to do is to change, like to give enough content and to prove enough results that I could become a part of the canon of cold email. And so what I mean by that is like, so often, like what I would love is if people think about like, how do I get started with cold email? They're like, Eric is the person who you go to. Like there's so many people that you can think of that you're like, okay, I learned Jeb, like Jeb Brunt taught me prospecting and you know, Je John Barrows taught me how to do discovery. And like, I want to give enough that people can go to the content and they're like, this is like the canon on how to do cold email. And so that's, I guess what we're working on now. I like it. And the last question is, where do you want people to go to learn about you? If they want to work with you, if they want to consume your content, what would be the best place to send them? And I'll include those links in the description. Yeah. So my LinkedIn is where I am all the time. Um, that's like actually the only social platform I'm on anymore, which I just tell my friends who aren't in B2B and they're like, that's, I'm like, I'll be like, connect with me on LinkedIn and they think it's the funniest thing ever. Um, and then my YouTube channel as well are basically the only ones. I stay pretty focused there. All right, perfect. Well, Eric, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. And uh, hope that we can come back to this conversation, do an update a year from now. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. All right, perfect.